The fire broke out in the early morning. I traveled quickly through the walls of the White House on the corner lot. The 69-year-old Ralph Waldo Emerson rushed out of his home, calling for help. Townspeople throughout Concord came running to his aid. They included Louisa May Alcott, who with her sisters were armed with baskets to rescue the books in his library. On a tour a few years ago, one of the historians pointed out a common feature of this home and others at the time. Hanging from the back stairway were two buckets, numbered to correspond specifically with your house. When a fire in town broke out, it was your duty to grab your buckets and run to the aid of your neighbor, regardless of what you were doing and whether you liked them or not. Once the fire was extinguished, you were required to leave your buckets with the fire department. They would take a full accounting of who came to help and who stayed home. If you failed to help your neighbor, you would be imposed with a tax and probably a dose of shame or embarrassment. The townspeople went beyond their duty and raised the necessary funds not only to restore Emerson's home, but to send him on a trip to Europe while the repairs were being completed. Upon his return, school was canceled for the day so the children could greet Emerson at the train station and escort him to his once again livable home. I longed for the days of buckets and duties, where it was expected that we would come to the aid of our fellow citizens, regardless of our own distractions or affinity towards him or her. Today, as then, the fires are not always literal. Life's devastating forces can come in many forms. Sickness, poverty, hate, lack of opportunity chief among them. If you listen carefully, regardless of where you live, you can hear the siren call of these fires amongst us. When we do, I hope we can all grab a bucket and do our duty. I'm Bob McKinnon, and you're listening to Attribution, where people from all walks of life reflect on who and what has contributed to where they ended up. Our hope is after each episode, you feel a little more inspired, grateful, or supported than when you first hit play. Today, I'm talking with Rachel Botsman, a leading expert and author on trust in the modern world. In our conversation, we talk about the underappreciated but fundamental role that trust plays in where we end up in life. Stay tuned for the end of the podcast, where Rachel comes to an interesting realization about her own work and the introduction of the idea of trust in equity. Have a listen. I hope you enjoy. So Rachel, I wanted to start with a little bit of where your work impacts your own personal life. You know, so you are by all measures, a very successful woman accomplished as an author, a speaker, a consultant. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how trust may have played a role in your own sort of personal journey. Well, I think it kind of comes full circle in terms of what first got me interested in the subject is still something I struggle with. Um, So I've always been fascinated by areas of our lives where we really struggle to trust um, and how that leads to all kinds of control issues and areas of our lives where we make really bad trust decisions, whether it's the companies we join, the bosses we have, the people we vote for, the partners that we bring into our lives. And I've always been deeply fascinated by the psychology of where we place our trust. And I think, you know, my husband always jokes that even, I think, you know, I've been studying this now for 12 years, that I'm still really bad at it, that I still make these terrible trust decisions But yet I can go into teams, I can work with leaders, I can see in my students and hopefully can really help them shift out of pretty complicated situations where trust is broken down. So I find that interesting that you can see it in other people. You can see you know, how some people, they so want to believe something, they will so look for a signal that they ignore everything else. Or other people who talk about emotional intelligence and intuition, and so they don't get enough information before making a decision, a high stakes decision. You can see it in other people. And yet time and time again, I make these mistakes in my own life. And that I find fascinating that's funny it's like a classic uh, what is it the uh, cobbler's uh, kids have no shoes right yeah yeah <laughs> when you think about 
where we end up in life and especially as it relates to sort of mobility and moving from, you know, one station in life to another, uh, people might not instinctively think, oh, well, trust is a factor for how your life turns out. But as I was reflecting on talking to you today, I was like thinking about all these different ways it sort of shows up. And I was wondering if you had any sort of top line thoughts and well, here I can point to three great examples on how trust is going to play out in terms of your own personal life outcomes. One of the things maybe we don't think about or have never made the connection is between trust and uncertainty. Basically, the equation is the more you trust yourself, the more trust there is, the more you can tolerate uncertainty. And that may be around sort of external uncertainties, like the current situation that we're in. It might be um, career uncertainties, uh, mental intellectual uncertainties, or physical uncertainties. And the default, what most people do in their lives, is they don't try to increase their tolerance for uncertainty, they try to minimize the risk. And so you can almost look at, you know, people's career paths. So people I know that have very windy um, careers where they go left, they go right, they step backwards, they jump to different industries. They have a very high tolerance for uncertainty. Whereas people that tend to still want that more linear path or get locked into it, like they can't make the change professionally, have a low tolerance to uncertainty. So how much we trust ourselves to make decisions and really dive into that unknown, whether that be a relationship, a place that you live, a different career, you could say molds the very shape of our lives. So my students are sort of in their late 20s to early 30s, and it's something they often say they never reflected on. You know, they're they're highly competitive, they're brilliant in their own right, but they've never thought about the areas of their life that they cannot let go of, that they really need to control. Maybe the heart of where their trust issues lie um, that can have a huge impact on the rest of their lives. When you mentioned the notion of uncertainty, it brings me back to something I had discovered a, a, a couple of years ago. I mean, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the famous marshmallow study, right? Yeah. For people listening, it was this study that was done, you know, in Stanford where they were trying to, with very young kids, test their willingness to delay gratification by, you know, saying you can, you, you're going to put it, this marshmallow in front of you now. And if you choose not to eat it, then we'll give you three later. And then they track those students 20 years later and associate all these positive life outcomes for those kid, kids who were able to wait. It used to be, you know, one of the takeaways from that study was, well, this is a, a, a really important lesson on trying to teach our children self-control. And what they found in a subsequent study was that actually the reason why many kids ate that one marshmallow was because of uncertainty because they didn't have trust in their lives that someone would keep the promise of delivering the three marshmallows later. It made me think of something, you know, we hear of inequity in all kinds of sort of forms, but I've never thought about sort of trust in equity. Mm. And so I didn't know if you'd heard the follow-up to the marshmallow study. And I was wondering if you could just sort of react to how, you know, maybe even at a young age, if you grow up in an atmosphere where, you know, trust is just not there, you know, how that can set you up for, you know, future failures or future difficulties. I hadn't made that connection, but it is fascinating. The way I define trust really gets to the heart of what you're talking about, Bob, in that I talk about trust as a, a confident relationship with the unknown. Now, what that means is that as a child, you sort of have faith that your parents will come home at eight o'clock if that's what they say they're going to come home that they will pick you up from school um and as an adult that gets sort of more and more magnified and so if your life experience is of things that you can't control always being disappointed or always being let down or the outcome being different from what you wanted or what you expected or what you were told, you are going to grow up pretty quickly with a distrustful ten tendencies. So that makes complete sense that if you, 
you know, if you had faith and confidence in the people running the experience, you would say, well, I know I'm going to get the three marshmallows, right? But this is the very essence of trust. If you don't believe that, you've got nothing to lose by eating the one marshmallow. And I think it's actually a beautiful illustration of what happens later on in life and how damaging trust issues can become to people's perception and expectations of themselves, but also what they can expect in other people. And that can be a downward spiral. Yeah. And it's interesting to me too, because it cuts at the core of how we judge others or and, and ourselves. So again, in the previous incarnation of that experiment, they would judge the kids as lacking something. And that lacking was something of their control, right? Mm -hmm. Versus them not receiving something, which is trust and consistency, which I wanted to, to talk to next. I, I read recently uh, something you'd written about your mom and your grandmother and their relationship. So first of all, I'm so sorry for your loss. I similarly had a very close relationship to my, to my grandmother and they're such wonderful influences in our lives because they bring such wisdom and, and again, consistency. And this notion that, that they had such this consistent relationship that was marked by a very specific behavior. Mm. I'll let you sort of share that, but I'm also wondering if you could think about how that consistency also aids us in establishing trusting relationships that, again, are important as we carry through with the rest of our lives. I, th I think I shared the story I was writing a piece about, and it's something I've been thinking a lot about, about the importance of consistency versus intensity when it comes to trust. So those relationships where people do small but consistent things and you really feel like you can depend on them. The story that I shared was I had a, a dear um, nana who my children called Super Nana and she was a real personality. Uh, she was the type of person you'd say, oh, Nana, you look lovely. And she'd say, oh, I know. Um, <laughs> very, very funny. And she called my mum on the dot at eight o'clock. And the funny thing is, I remember this as a child. Like, I remember the phone call because sometimes we'd be on the car on the way to school. And mum would sometimes get frustrated. Like, why does she call me every day at eight o'clock and ask the same question which is how are you a mum would usually say I'm fine and then she'd always say is there anything I can do for you today and she genuinely meant it like whatever it was pick us up make dinner get milk whatever it was she she would do that and my mum unfortunately lost her uh, her sister and her mum very close together and this was real grief and you know she says the thing that she misses the most is not Christmas and the big days and the birthdays. They're hard. She misses that phone call. And I thought about this recently because um, I was thinking about in lockdown how often the small consistent things, how important they become in terms of anchoring us and giving us stability. But as a culture and society, personally, I think we place too much emphasis on the grand gestures, the intensity. You know, and I see this, like I have two kids who are now nine and six and they have uh, one grandparent and probably by geography, who's very much in their lives, the good, the bad and the ugly, he is there, right? And then there's another grandparent and, you know, calls maybe every three months, but then shows up in a really big way. Lots of presents, lots of activities and the kids, they go to the other grandparent because they like the consistency and the stability. Um, yeah, I think we forget that as we grow up as adults, that we think we can make it up through these grand gestures and this intensity, and, and we underestimate how much consistency provides a stabilizing force, but how important it is for trust. Yeah, so I was connecting the dots to your personal story, to some things that I've been noticing and also confirmed by research in the social sector, right? And this idea when they try to evaluate what makes for a successful intervention and isolate sort of one factor. Uh, I've seen in numerous programs, including uh, one in the town where I grew up, Chelsea, Massachusetts, ROCA, which is a really interesting intervention for those people who are involved in the juvenile system and are, you know, like one strike away from their life just being completely out of control. 
And what they found was that it was about the consistency of people checking in with them mm -hmm. and always showing up for them and sort of being very dogged about it. And it was this question of, of frequency and dosage and consistency. And we see that time, you, you know, you see that in studies around mentoring, you know, it's not like, let me send you a gift. It's like, Hey, we're going to talk every Friday at four. It seems so simple and it's not as newsworthy as mm -hmm. like, you know, um, something else like, Oh, look, we, you know, did this awesome, you know, thing for someone, look at this, but it just sort of speaks to how simple some of this stuff can be. And yet, underappreciated. When I think of like uh, leadership, um, particularly sort of um, public programs, right, we make up for inconsistency through intensity. Um, so we haven't been there. So we'll come in in this really big intervention and big way. And then where do people go? And, um, you know, one of the a really great book I read recently is by James Clear. Um, it's called Atomic Habits. And it's about micro changes in your life. I usually don't like books like this. But the, the quote that really stuck in my mind is he says, intensity makes a good story. Consistency makes progress. And again, so simple, but you can see if we thought in this way, we think completely differently about policy and education and, and even relationships and team building. So I think it's really important and underappreciated force, quality, whatever we want to call it. You, you mentioned government policy, education, things like that. So I want to shift a little bit to some chat about institutions. Implicit in, in, in certainly in America and in other places, this sort of trust in our society that if you work hard enough, that you can do anything, right? And that magically there will be the supports that are there when necessary and the freedom um, allowed when also helpful. And yet we know that there are certain things like, you know, the quality of our schools and the, and the inequity there, uh, the way in which, you know, business sometimes operates um, in terms of how they treat their consumers, certainly uh, politics, the role of money and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, our institutions maybe aren't supporting the idea of the uh, American dream or, you know, social mobility to the same uh, extent. And yet again, maybe that's going unnoticed because people largely think that it's something that's in their control. They trust themselves to work hard enough. And if they do that, it should have the proper outcome. And so I'm wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit about where we are with institutions and our relationships with them and whether we even expect them to show up for us as it relates to helping us, you know, or whether we're just like, hey, this isn't working. So I'm going to either turn to myself or to a smaller group or different types of institutions. As you know, well, I, I've lived in the States for 10 years and Australia for another 10 years and now back in the UK. And I think what struck me is they are very different cultures, but there are distinct patterns in our relationship with institutions. And by institutions, I mean, media, government, education, financial institutions. There are no trust issues. Like, no, I'm joking. <laughs> I think it's actually more complex than saying we don't trust these institutions. I think it's got something more to do with scale. That And these things are tied, but these systems have got so big that they can no longer serve me the individual that the system serves the system if that makes sense so I think it's actually the next stage what distrust leads to which is you know disengagement and defensiveness and disenchantment which as you're talking about can have a positive impact because what happens is you start to see more self-reliance and more re resilience where you know, someone says, well, I can get the best education in the world and I'll still be in debt. And so therefore it's up to me to really figure out a different path. You know, I don't think the way the financial system is set up will serve me in terms of being able to even afford to buy a home at any point in my lifetime. So how do I create a different dream, a different goal um, that becomes meaningful? I don't think we're quite there yet where we have reinvented the narrative and what the dream is and what the end goals are. 
I think we are very much in the messy middle of, wow, these institutions are not going to even provide the safety net or the protection that I expected. But the optimist says in me says, well, this will actually create future generations of resilience that may reinvent the narrative of what a not even successful life looks like, a fulfilling life looks like. Um, But that, I think, is a few decades off. I want to go to where you started with this, which is this notion of things getting bigger, right? And systems that are really hard to sort of shape or influence or trust. Have, have we lost our way in even trying to talk and tackle systems instead of looking at what's in front of us, right? So you are in a school, what can you do with that school mm-hmm. versus fixing a system? And have individuals been given the responsibility or the tools to influence what they can around them or find other paths, you know, at a higher level politically or, or whatever, that it's harder to influence and people feel disempowered. So, so you, nothing happens as a result. I say up front, I'm a huge champion of local systems. Um, so even how you take a mass education system and you give local schools more autonomy around decision making, I think it's the only way to go in the way we redesign these things. But I think what you're pointing out is, is important because if you think about sort of the media moments, the things people see, it's large protests and all about large change and huge influence. And um, and you're sort of left with this impression that unless you're a celebrity, unless you have a huge social media following, unless you can impact a change in climate change policy, or whatever it is, that you don't have a power or a say in some community we were talking earlier on like community can be your street um so in some ways this definition of community and i think this has a lot to do with social media even that has been scaled to something that feels beyond tangible influence and so if i think of like the last 30 40 years and what's really damaged trust is this focus on scale and how it will lead to efficiency around systems, how things can be more efficient at scale. And we just pay no attention to the impact that has on individuals in terms of their perception around what they can impact and what they can have influence. And my worry then is people not just don't do, they don't just disengage, they start to then look elsewhere for other communities and group identities where they do feel this sense of belonging, that it does feel their social self. And these aren't always trustworthy groups or people. You mentioned local systems uh, versus sort of large things at scale, uh, et cetera. Some people would read that in the States as sort of local versus federal sort of responsibility on certain things. And to me, it's interesting that when we think about trust, right, some of it has to be sort of about letting go. Mm. And so one of the arguments that some people on maybe the left would argue is that, you know, yes, there should be some local control, but maybe I don't trust certain localities to make decisions around, for example, what textbooks they should use or what standards they should have, whether that be uh, certain kinds of laws or in our, in our schools or what have you. And on the other hand, politically here, uh, if you are more on the right, you may have distrust for your federal government Mm. for fear that they are going to make arbitrary rules or distinctions that would impede your own personal freedom. So I don't even, I don't know if you have any thoughts on the origin of those levels of distrust, but maybe also the question of what can you even do about it, if anything, or do you just try to understand, like, is it to tell people to, hey, just stay home and worry about your own thing um, and trust others to do so? Or what is the, what's the balance there? either side right comes from a place of fear what i always try to understand is what is the motivation behind either side wanting or needing to believe something why does one side believe that if you gave more autonomy to local education systems they would all make bad decisions um, and the other side believe that you should centralize 
power with federal agencies. I haven't done research in that area, um, but I think it comes back to what we've talked about, which is issues of where control and power should lie and very different views around that. I personally think where we've messed up, particularly in education, but we see this in healthcare and, and even law enforcement, is that we've got models and functions that really should play sort of a macro management role, right? They should really set visions, set guidelines, and then, as you say, let go and let the implementation form at a smaller local level that can really react and adapt and respond to the context and the needs of that particular community. And that's where I think we've ended up with a big fat mess of sort of macro management and micro management and neither side really being happy with the outcome. You know, and it's interesting in the in the UK, um, they tried this thing you, you're probably aware called the big society. Um, so this was like, I don't know if you know about this idea, but it was Cameron's big vision to sort of uh, decentralize certain roles of government. And the interesting thing is that there was a real backlash against it. And I think it's really interesting that people just called it socialist. Like that, that was the human response of uh, we're going to put more responsibility in the hands of people and local mayors and local councils. And and people just called it a left leaning socialist idea. Um, so even that is I, I think we need a whole new language and vocabulary of talking about these systems and how they could function completely differently. It's funny. I was going to ask you uh, separately. It was uh, what 10 years since your first book came out. What's mine is yours. And I was wondering if if someone just looking at that title right now in the States would sort of look at that as like a socialist manifesto when it's anything but, right? And it is this <laughs> notion of understanding our opportunity to collaborate and come together. It frightens people in a way that I don't, I don't, I don't personally quite understand. Well, someone actually joked, I think it was a journalist joke a few years after that. I should have called it, what's yours is mine or something like that. And then someone... <laughs> This, this journalist actually wrote a book with that title as a whole critique on the premise of the so-called a sharing economy. But I think missing the point that we sort of can't reconcile that self-interest and collective interest, they can go hand in hand. Um, I haven't read the book in a long time, but... Um, you know, I think it's it's interesting on the scale note, like how when I wrote that 10 years ago, Airbnb, I think, had seven employees when I interviewed them. And, you know, I take responsibility for this, that you often can't see the unintended consequences of your ideas at scale. I say when people want to criticize and challenge my ideas on the sharing economy, bring it on. Right. But we have to learn from why couldn't we see that even 10 years ago? I just want to take a few moments to thank our partner. Attribution is distributed in part by Chasing the Dream, a public media initiative from PBS flagship station WNET in New York, reporting on poverty, justice, and economic opportunity in America. You can learn more at pbs.org backslash chasing the dream. And now back to our conversation. You know, getting to the question of sort of uh, challenging each other and something you said earlier in terms of when we feel a lack of trust or community in one area, we look to try to find it somewhere else. And I've been noticing this uh, with my friends and my family and how it manifests itself online, where there's a greater likelihood that they will share something from a stranger than they will have a conversation with a friend or a family member about a topic that is challenging, like our current sort of political situation. I, and I'll look at that and objectively know that what they're sharing is factually inaccurate, but maybe comports with their beliefs, right? So then it's how do you how do you say, hey, you can trust me, let's have a conversation about this versus people just feeling the sense of belonging that they're getting from identifying with certain things that confirm their existing beliefs. So uh, I, I was wondering if you could sort of just talk a little bit about you know, that dynamic and how that's being played out, the role of technology in exacerbating that versus trying to ameliorate it and maybe even how you're seeing it in your own, you know, life and experiences. It's funny, my 
whole new body of work is on beliefs. I think I naturally got there from studying the world of trust and really trying to understand um, like trust is like the gatekeeper of the mind, the information that we let in, the people that we let in, why we let strangers in and not the people closest to us. Um, and the thing I think I underestimated before really looking into this subject was how much beliefs are not pulled by accuracy, they're pulled by conformity. I mean, it sounds so obvious to say, but once you start to see it, how much identity is the biggest motivator and and pull of our beliefs. And it's funny you say this because this happened to me over the last um, few months with people I really respect, leaders, journalists, sort of asking the same question, which is like, how can those idiots believe that? Or, or like, how can anyone believe Trump? And I find that question in itself completely offensive. I can see why people, I don't believe Trump, but I can see why people believe Trump. I, I can see why anti-vaxxers hang out in these communities. Um, I can see why climate change skeptics would much rather be around people that believe the same thing than their family who's telling them they're a terrible person. And so... To answer your question, I think what social media does is it it makes it easier for people to find a home and it makes it easier for people to be pushed away. And that I think is sort of a systemic cause of much of the divisiveness and polarization that we see in the world, that we focus way too much on what people believe without being curious of why they may need to believe that. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, in response to some of what I was seeing, I wrote an op-ed recently uh, that was entitled uh, A Letter to My Friends and Family in Pennsylvania. And it ran in some local papers, and it was essentially an invitation to a conversation. And part of it was, you know, hey, admitting that there were some things that President Trump had done that had benefited me personally, like the tax cuts, right? But also saying, here's who I support, and I'm not trying to convince you that you should support this person, but I want to understand and have a conversation about what you believe in. And not for the sake of, you know, again, changing a, changing a mind, but that both of our minds could be opened. And this idea of, I've always been fascinated by this idea of just asking better questions. And we don't seem to do a very good job of that, of, you know, there's this wonderful quote I use a lot um, from Galileo that you cannot teach a man anything, but you can give him the tools to discover it with himself. Mm -hmm. And I think one of those tools is a question, you know, so you just get someone to think about something. And I'm wondering if you were trying to have a conversation with someone whose beliefs weren't necessarily the same as yours, how might you bridge that topic that could lead to a productive conversation? Because what I had seen after I'd published this is I'd gone online and started sort of connecting with some friends and had these fascinating conversations about fracking and faith and the military uh, versus protests. And, you know, I think we were both better for it. And, it, yeah. you know, regardless of whether a political view was changed, it was just, it was just helpful. I mean, this is how I spend my time right now is listening to people with very different beliefs from sexuality to gender to flat earthers, you name it. And it's been really friggin' hard because I think, you know, a principled person, which I like to think I, I am principled, is often very judgmental, right? Like there's two sides <laughs> And I have become so self-aware of not the need to be right but the need to prove someone else wrong and how my entire education if I think about it has I've had to rewire my mind and my emotional reactions and so the first thing I say is it is incredibly hard to listen to people who believe something different but there are two things that I'm finding are really helpful the first is actually throwing in the way the word empathy and leading with curiosity, which I think then can lead to empathy. Just to give an example, I was talking with several women who believe vaccinations caused autism. 
which is a really sensitive fat, um, subject for me because I wasn't vaccinated and as a child. I went blind from the measles, right? So I 100% believe in vaccinations, but I wasn't there to convince them of my views. I was there to learn where their views had come from. And trying to be empathetic to their situation didn't help, but just being completely curious around why they needed to believe this, I reached this realization that we were driven by the same force, which was parental love. We were driven by the same thing of wanting to do what was best for our children. But that came from curiosity of just what, why did that form? When did that happen? And who had that influence? And piecing things together like a puzzle. So curiosity, I think, is incredibly helpful and can actually get you out of that defensive reflex. The second is humility. I mean, I think if there is a skill that we should be teaching and learning, not just children, but ourselves, is how we can create cultures and live in a world where we can say we were wrong and not be criticized and not be judged. Um, How we can change a point of view. And I think the problem is that we live in a world, and in some way Trump epitomized this, of, of confidence and sort of blustering uh, narrative. Um, and this sort of quiet quality of humility has just been crushed. And even the word humility, when you say it to people, I think people see it as a lack of confidence or a lack of credibility, you know, if you're humble. Um, but those two things, I think, really holding on to humility and curiosity in a conversation a very difficult conversation can be a way through i don't know how long it was probably like seven years or something like that there was this mad rush to empathy as being sort of this end-all be-all solution to so many of our society's ills and i feel like we uh we we jumped the shark a little bit on it you know that there was a lot of prerequisite emotions that are required before you can simply try to put yourself in someone else's shoes. It was this mass oversimplification. And to your point, curiosity, humility, we talk a lot about, you know, this, this idea of attribution, like what do we think, you know, understanding yourself first, you know, before you can put yourself in someone else's shoes, you should figure out how you ended up in your own. And I think that your example of parental love is a good acknowledgement of that. To me, it is it is fascinating that there are these, I mean, I don't even want to undersell it because soft skills sound so soft, right? But these tools that we are just not necessarily valuing to the extent that sort of sets us up for a better life for ourselves and and for others. And I don't know if you see that in, in your students or, or in others, but it is interesting that we are not maybe equipping people with what would be helpful I wonder if this is coming next. I wonder if sort of the focus on um, health and wellness, which then sort of led to a focus on mental well-being, if the next step on from that will be sort of a really deep self-awareness in how we see the world, how perceptions form perspectives, and that um, in the same way we've seen a lot of now what we call pop psychology sort of enter education if genuinely understanding the way you think and the way you process information whether that will become part of our education and what is the new word for this because i don't think it's self-awareness right like we we almost need a new word to describe this focus and need to think about the way we see reality and what influences that picture. And the reason why I think this is so important is the work I've done on technology and trust has taken me pretty deep into conversations with entrepreneurs and regulators about solutions around misinformation. And I have to say, you know, I've sort of reached this point where, yes, there is algorithms and there is fact checking and there is incentives and there's penalties but I think the greatest hope we have is actually training and developing these skill sets to really understand the way we 
are pulled or pushed away from information and influences and events and people. Because, because essentially that's describing something that we need to evolve into if we want to sort of continue to sort of thrive as individuals or society. And yeah, the skills that were necessary as, as humans, you know, thousands of years ago are not necessarily the ones that are valued now. Some, some are, some not, uh, but new ones definitely need to, uh, to, to get a little bit of, uh, of attention. We often sort of think about the dynamics of, of trust as something that plays out in our individual actions and conversations. And I heard something really recently about maybe this is the flip side of confidence, the willingness to sort of trust someone else or to ask for help, right? You need to have some level of trust to help. And I remember a story I'd heard a while ago, like if you needed something right now and you, you know, didn't have access to it, you might ask a friend, like, do you know a lawyer or a doctor or whatever that would give you a good recommendation, right? And you'd be able to sort of navigate through that world uh, because you had a network of trust, um, trusted individuals you could tap into. And I remember a story that someone had told me recently where there was a person who was working inside someone's home regularly. Like, I think it was, I don't know if it was, I think it was a nanny. And her family, she had a family member that was facing a serious deportation issue. Mm -hmm. The person she was working for was a lawyer. Yeah. And did not feel comfortable asking for help. And I think that the employer, you know, overheard something one day and then interjected and was able to sort of intervene in a way that was sort of helpful. But the, the, the notion of sort of trust being, it's like an action word, right? It's not sort of passive. It's something that we have to deploy and use. And it requires a certain level of confidence. And again, going back to where we started the conversation, sometimes there may be moments where if that trust has failed, it's like, well, I'm not going to put myself out there again. And so some restoration is, is needed. I don't, I don't know if you have any sort of thoughts on these examples where you see, again, I, I don't want to create a new term, but this inequity in how trust is being utilized and how that plays and why some people seem to, they, they can move up because they're using it more and other people are sort of stuck because they don't feel comfortable. No, it's, it's a really great question. I mean, it's like you're probably familiar with Keith Payne's work on the broken ladder. Mm -hmm. I think it's an amazing book on sort of the link between inequality and perception. And when I was reading that book, I thought, how have I not thought of this? You know, shame on me, because I'm thinking of this from a white female privilege point of view of how trust is an enabler. It's a social enabler. It enables mobility. And I'd never, I mean, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit that, but I'd never made that connection before really diving into Keith Payne's work. And the reason why, and this is really important, that I love Brené Brown's work, and I think Dan Cole is brilliant, but this idea that you can lead with vulnerability and that trust will follow, the idea that you should feel safe asking for help and emotionally exposing yourself is a very privileged point of view. You, you have to feel some ele element of safety and stability, whether that's asking your parent for help or teacher for help or boss for help, you, or, you know, the person that you work for, that they can help your family, that what's going on in that situation, that person doesn't feel safe, right? So they've gone into that mode of self-protection. And I'd never, shame on me for making this, protect, uh, this connection that, yes, when you are in a safe, secure culture and environment, if you can be vulnerable, it's like rocket fuel for trust. But millions of people don't have that kind of safety and security. So it, it creates a horrible cycle, right, that they don't feel safe enough to trust someone, to be vulnerable, to ask for help. And that, I think, is a dynamic that can be created really early on. I think it's a really powerful question. And I, you know, it's one of those things where you're like, how could I have not seen this before? How could I have, you know, spoken the Kool-Aid, like we should all be vulnerable and then trust will follow. And you c that's not the case for many, many people. That's a wonderful note to end on. And uh, I'm glad we got to that. I close the show each 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 episode with uh, you know typically you do this 
we do credits, who edited it, who, you know, did the music, all that kind of stuff. But I, uh, I like to give the opportunity for guests to do their own credits. <laughs> so I put you on the spot a little bit. So I wanted you to just take a few minutes and say a couple names of some folks who you give credit to for where you are. The caveat is always don't feel bad about leaving anyone out. Um, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> and uh, you had no uh, advance notice of the question. But I just always love the opportunity for people just to express gratitude for others, even if the people listening don't even know who they are. Yeah. So go for it. Okay. It's such a great, it's such a great question. Um, I'm going to try and people pick people from different chapters of my life. So I'm going to pick a boss I had called Ben, who in my early twenties told me I was completely unemployable and that I needed to do something with that. I give him a lot of credit um, for my life journey. I then had probably one of the toughest bosses in my life when I was working for the Clinton Foundation called Ira Magazina, who I know you know, um, who basically told me that if I had a big idea, uh, why think about it? Why not go and do it in the world? So he's really responsible for the kick around my first book. And then I had a wonderful mentor at Oxford, um, who was a woman called Pamela Hartigan, who unfortunately passed away, who basically showed me that my passion was teaching and that that's where my joy really came from. And she taught me how to move from being sort of an author and presenter and thought leader to a teacher, which is a very different space you have to create in the classroom. So I think those those three people deserve a lot of appreciation and thanks. Even if in those conversations, I probably walked away and went, I'm unemployable. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It is funny, like the little things that people can say us or the way in which people can point us in a certain path that make all the difference in the world. Yeah. And so, uh, Rach, this has been great. I thank you for taking uh, the time. It's always great to talk and catch up. And stay well. You too. Thank you for listening to Attribution. This show was edited by Luke Robert Mason, music by Johnny Most Davis. Attribution is a production of the Moving Up Media Lab, whose mission is to inspire people to reflect on who and what has made their lives possible. To learn more and sign up for our weekly newsletter, please visit movingupusa.com. Today's final credit goes to you, the listener, and to everyone who helped you get to where you are today. If this show has reminded you of someone special, make their day and let them know.